Okay, welcome back everyone to our third lecture on Revelation Daniel. We are journeying through the book of Revelation. We are going to start with chapter 13. Any questions so far from chapter 12, which we just covered? Any questions, Sri Kumar, please? Yeah, thank you, sir. Sir, I, I, I want to know two things. Uh, uh, when we say that um, the Satan will be uh, is coming back or the devil is coming back, so he will manifest where people can see him or it is a spiritual manifestation, like uh, how whatever we are facing at this point of time, or he will he will reveal himself uh, in like where people can see him or worship him or whatever whichever way and second thing when we say the antichrist is it is it will he will be an will he be a human being or um, or a spiritual being like you know or he's born of some like you know uh, or angelic being or something like that or uh, he's uh, he's going to be uh, a man or something i just want to know thank you sir yeah so uh to answer your first question, uh, Satan will be operating just the way he operates today, meaning in, in, in a spiritual um, sense, Satan and the demonic powers will be operating the way they're operating today, as spirit beings influencing life on earth. Right, So they're going to continue doing that. Um, so we're not going to see Satan himself, or the people are not going to see Satan himself, but Satan is going to be carrying out his maneuvers, his work through people and by instigating people. Second question, Antichrist, the beast and the false prophet will be people, human beings, who are empowered by the dragon. And this is what we're actually going to see. We're actually going to see this in chapter 13. The, you know, the, the very question you asked, we will see it in chapter 13, where the beast and the false prophet, or the second beast, they are empowered by the dragon. So the dragon, meaning the devil, is a spiritual being. He's empowering two human individuals on the earth. Now we can understand this very easily, because you know today we, we have people who are empowered by the devil, carrying out various things. They're doing supernatural things or doing things, but they're empowered by the devil. But this is going to reach the highest point, meaning there will be no other man so empowered by the devil except this and this for this, but for this antichrist and by a false prophet. We will see that. Yeah. Thank you. Sir. Um, so let's read through chapter 13. Now, I want to make a few comments about chapter 13 before we start reading it. Revelation 13 connects us back to a lot of what we looked in Daniel. So you will see that there is some prophetic imagery here in chapter 13, which we actually read about and studied about in Daniel. So there's this wonderful connection happening. And then we will we will see other things that are really amazing in, 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 in chapter 13, which the first beast and the second beast, or the Antichrist and the false prophet, are going to do. And the third comment I want to make is that chapter 13, very much like chapter 11 and chapter 12, is talking about what these two people will be doing for three and a half years. Right? So this is their activity. There's more coming up. There will be more revealed in chapters uh, 17 and 18 about the, the Antichrist and the false prophet, or the first beast and second beast. But chapter 13 captures or captures their activity for the second half of the tribulation, the three and a half years. Now remember, the Antichrist has come on the scene from the beginning of the tribulation. He was the man, the rider on the white horse. He came as a man of peace. He set up a seven-year peace treaty to establish peace, a covenant. But in the middle of the seven years, he has broken the covenant he has set himself up as God, 
and things have gone really bad. He is now attacking Israel, the Jewish people, and also anybody who professes the name of Christ. So keep that in mind. And chapter 13 is saying, okay, this is how bad it's going to get in the second half of the tribulation. So let's read through chapter 13. We will read the first 10 verses. Revelation 13, 1 to 10, three verses each, please. You can start. Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his head a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. And I saw one of his head as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world marveled and followed the beast. Thank you. Was four words, please. So there was said the dragon gave authority to the beast. And they worship the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And he was given a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies. And he was given authority to continue for 42 months. Then he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, the tabernacle and those who dwell in heaven. Verse 7 onwards, please, somebody. It is given power to wage war against God's holy people and to conquer them. And it was given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. All inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast, all whose name have not written have not been written in the Lamb's book of life. The Lamb was slain from the creation of the world. Whoever has ears, let them hear. Okay. Verse 10 also, please. If anyone is to go into captivity, into captivity they will go. Anyone is to be killed with the sword, with the sword they will be killed. This calls for patient endurance and faithfulness on the, on the part of God's people. Mm. Okay, thank you. So, we start off with verse 1. So, John is saying, of course, uh, this is the continuation of his vision. He's seeing this beast come out of the sea. Now, in the book of Revelation, like I said earlier, water, sea, represents multitudes or the nations, uh, multitudes of peoples or the nations. And this is, uh, you know, from Revelation, the 17th chapter. We'll come in there and there we get an, the interpretation of that figure, that picture. Seas or waters represent nations and peoples. And so here comes this beast. Now, there is some understanding here of where he comes from, what is his origins like? Verse 2, we'll come back to verse 1, but verse 2, there is the leopard, the bear, the lion. They're all, so the beast is a mix of the leopard, the bear, the lion. So, this is where we go back to what we have learned from Daniel. Daniel talked about, you know, he had in chapter two there was this image, you know, of the head, the the head of gold. Then there was the uh, um, silver, the chest, then the bronze, then there was iron, and then the feet were mix of iron and clay, and in the days of that, God set up his kingdom. And then as you progress through 
Daniel, Daniel begins to, you know, he sees various beasts coming out. And we can connect these images back to uh, what Daniel saw. The leopard, we can connect it to the Greeks, the bear, connected back to the Medes and Persians. There is no lion in, ba in, in, uh, in uh, Daniel's vision, but this represents for us the fourth kingdom, the Babylonian, uh, oh, sorry, the, the Babylonian kingdom, the, uh, the starting point, the head, the Babylonian. So we see that basically this beast is coming from this particular region, which is clear to us, which Daniel explained to us in chapters 8 and 9. So he's emerging from this region, which was a mix of all of these, these empires, where these empires previously existed, Babylonians, the Medes, the Greeks, Medes and Persians, the Greeks. So the beast is coming out from that region. And he's got these 10 horns. Again, we see that already in Daniel, meaning the 10 leaders are come, going to come up from there. And, uh, uh, and uh, he has seven heads, uh, talking about, headship seven uh, heads and he has a blasphemous name again connecting back to Daniel one of the the key marks of this Antichrist this beast is he's gonna blaspheme against God we see this right here in, in Revelation 13 we've seen it in Daniel Paul repeats it um, that this this in 2nd Thessalonians 2 that this man will be speaking blasphemous things so it kind of gives us some identity to this beast, right? He's coming out of this region from the nations where previously there were these empires, the Babylonians, the Medes, the Persians, and the Greeks. They existed in this region. And the beast is like a mixture of that. He's coming from that region. Uh, specifically, Daniel had mentioned about 10 horns and little horn arising and overtaking three of these ten horns and then they eventually these ten leaders would put this beast into power so these ten leaders who are all from that same region have a role to play in pushing this little horn the beast the antichrist into a place of prominence in the natural but in the spiritual what john is telling us is the dragon end of verse 2 the dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. So Daniel described the whole process in, in the natural. There are ten horns will come, a little horn will come, he'll take over three of these horns, and then he will be come into power. These ten horns will push him up there. We will read about this later on in Revelation 13, 17, what happens. Um, uh, so this they are eventually going to push this little horn into power. But John is telling us, overall, it's the devil behind this. The dragon, which is the devil, gave him his power, his throne and great authority. Meaning, this influence of this little horn this beast is having is actually coming from the devil. Verse 3 seems to indicate that this man was mortally wounded, but he survived, which um, causes everybody to marvel and choose to follow him. So if you interpret this into some modern terms, maybe, you know, um, um, maybe that there is... Uh, you know, if you if you if you jump to verse fourteen of the same chapter, we haven't read that yet, but it's referencing back to this beast. Here it says in the end of verse fourteen of Revelation thirteen, it says, "The beast who was wounded by the sword and lived." Right. So talking about the same beast, it's, it's a cross reference to verse three, Revelation thirteen three. That means uh, there must have been some sort of an attempt to kill him. With the sword, meaning it could have been a gun or whatever, you know, but John, John would not have understood if God showed him a gun. So, so some attempt to kill this beast, this man, but he lived. So, which gives him that much more stature among people 
people marvel, wow, he survived. So we don't know exactly what it is, but most likely there may have been an assassination attempt on this man, uh, but he just, he lives. So people are like, oh, he survived. And it draws more people to follow him. And then verse 4 says, people started worshipping the beast. The beast is the man, the Antichrist. But the man, in worshipping the beast, you're actually worshipping the dragon. That's verse 4. They worship the dragon who gave authority to the beast, and they worship the beast. So now this Antichrist has put himself in a place of being worshipped by people. And verse 5, he is speaking blasphemous things, so much like what Daniel already prophesied about. And this is for 42 months, verse 5. So that's why we say, Revelation 13 is describing what the Antichrist is going to do or what's going to happen during the second half of the tribulation. 42 months, three and a half years, 1,260 days. Yeah, it's all very consistent. And verse 6, he's opening his mouth, he's blaspheming God, the tabernacle, and he's just speaking. And then he's going against the people of God. Verse 7, he's making war. And he's gaining global influence. Verse Seven authority was given to him over tribe, tongues, and nation. It's global influence. We're saying all on earth are going to worship him. As people are going to start worshiping him, they're giving their devotion to this man. And but these are the people whose names are not written in the Lamb's Book of Life. But at this time, verse 10, for the saints. They're going to go into captivity. They're going to face death. And the only way to go through this, John says, is you've got to have patience and hold on to your faith. So he's telling us, hey, it's going to be a really difficult time for the saints, for those who believe in Jesus during this time, second half. They're going to be put in prison or they're going to be killed. And the only way to go through this is to have endurance and faith. What else is going to happen? Verse 11 onwards, please. Verse 11 to verse 18. Somebody could read it. Uh, with, sorry, three verses each. Then I saw another beast coming out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a, like a dragon. And he exercises all authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast. Whose deadly wound was healed. He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. Thank you. Verse 14 on. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast. Telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lay. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads. Okay. Last two verses, 17 and 18, somebody, please. And that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is 666. Thank you. Mm. Thank you. So, verse 11 onwards. John is saying, there's another beast. So this we refer to as the second beast. Now, later on in, uh, I think it's, let me just check, chapter 16, verse 13, he's referred to as the false prophet. Hmm? Revelation 16, 13, the second beast is called the false prophet. And then in Revelation 19 and verse 20, um, uh, 
yeah, once again, he's called the false prophet. So the second beast is referred to as the false prophet, right? So uh, this second beast, he sees a second beast coming up. And he's like a lamb pretending to be like Jesus, a like a lamb, like a spiritual leader. But he speaks like a dragon. That means he's speaking actually inspired by uh, the devil, and he speaks very deceptively. So he's called a false prophet. And he shows lots of signs and wonders, the second man. And his goal is to get people to worship the beast, the Antichrist. The Antichrist and the false prophet are both empowered by the dragon, that is the devil. And this false prophet is doing mighty signs. What is like Elijah is calling fire from heaven and he's doing wonder, you know, miracles. So you can imagine during his three and a half years. There are two prophets of God who are doing signs and wonders. There are, There is this Antichrist, the first beast, who is gaining influence globally. And there is this false prophet who is getting people to worship the Antichrist. And as part of his, so we say, you know, the, a religious movement started by this false prophet, a one a religious movement, or you know, some people refer to it as one world religion or a religious system by this false prophet. And his goal is you've got to worship the beast, the Antichrist. So he gets people to make an image of the beast, keep it with them. And this image is able to speak and it's even able to kill people. If they don't do what the image says and they worship the image. Now, how exactly that's going to play out, uh, you know, it, whether it's purely supernatural or whether he would use technology and things like that to do it, you know, we don't know. But this is what John saw happening an image that's speaking, and people are worshiping the image of the beast. And it is during this time. Two things happen. So we can see this in Revelation 13. First, we are seeing what we refer to as a world religious system being set up. And the goal of this world religious system is for people to worship the beast or the image of the beast. But when you're worshiping the beast, you're worshiping the dragon, the devil. And that's what the devil is after. He wanted God's throne because he wanted to be worshipped like God. He couldn't get it. He's making his best attempt here on earth for three and a half years. I mean, he's already done it, but this is his biggest attempt. The second thing we see here is that the first piece and the second piece, that is the Antichrist and the false prophet, introduce what we can refer to it as a as a global economic system or a, a a worldwide economic system, meaning you cannot buy or sell, you cannot transact, you cannot have any financial transaction unless you have the mark of the beast. So the mark of beast is a number. He says six six six. So it could be some actual number that's being used, but you've, you've got to have this number on your hand or on your forehead. And only if you have it put upon you, can you transact, can you buy or sell. Now, when you think about this, in today's world, this is very possible. It's very possible. Like in John's time, uh, it wouldn't, couldn't, could not have done it. 
when John was writing these things and I was being given a vision of these things. Hey, no way. But in our day and our time, everyone, I mean, everyone could fall in line to this. In other words, if you want to be a part of this global economic system, you've got to have the mark of the beast. Now, how this mark of the beast is going to be put up on people, there's so many options. Right? You can you can embed a chip either in your right hand or in your forehead. Or there's so many other things that could be used these days. You know, so in, instead of, you know, we started with credit cards, you swipe your card, you tap your card, you enter your number. Uh, we can do, you know, bar, there used to be barcode scanning, QR code, all these, lots of technologies have all come up over the years. But eventually, what John is saying is, this, you know, if you want to use the word identification, or this form of authentication to, in order to transact, will be personal, personalized. It'll be on your right hand or on your forehead. You know, it's going to get to that point. Right now, it's like we're all carrying cards or some some something to tap or swipe. But it's going to get closer than that. And we're all comfortable in the sense, uh, you know, we, many of us do use these uh, credit cards to, for, for, all our, for much of our financial transactions. Or we can you know, just do it directly off the phone, uh, so on and so forth. But the point is this, the technology to make this happen, what John has described here in Revelation chapter 13, verses 16 and 17, the technology to make it happen, to actually, for this to happen, is right here today. It is not there in John's time, but today, Verses 16 and 17 can literally be fulfilled. That we can participate. Somebody can set up an economic system where you can participate, where you can transact through some form of identification that is placed upon your own person. It's available today. You know, so to sign into your laptop, you can use your fingerprint or some other form of, you know, just personal identification. And then you can transact from there. So, what we're seeing in Revelation 13 is, during the second half of the tribulation, the three and a half years, there's going to be the beast, the first beast and the second beast, or the Antichrist and the false prophet, who are going to have global influence. There's going to be a global economic system, and there's going to be a global religious system. The goal of the global religious system is to get people to worship the beast, the goal of the global economic system is to pledge allegiance to the beast, the Antichrist. Yes, I'm under him. I'm, I'm participating in what he set up. Everybody good so far? Yes, Pastor. Okay. So, Christopher, you have a question, please. Go ahead. Oh, yes, Pastor. I just wanted to get some understanding on on the timeline. So there may be some a couple of questions on that. Um, I just wanted to understand, you know, from the rapture to the tribulation, uh, is that immediate or is there is, is there some gap uh, in uh, you know the time that it's, uh, that, ha that it happens? Uh, that is one. The second thing is uh, I just wanted to understand when the um, the Antichrist is. Um, uh, you know, doing that peace treaty. Um, at that time, um, I mean, when does it actually happen? Um, is it happening at right the beginning of the tribulation, or does it happen even before that? Um, and um, the third one would be just around this. Um, I mean, this model, more of a comment, uh, where, as, as you mentioned, the devil is trying his best to take control, uh, trying, trying to, you know maintain some controlling on the earth but this is also the time when god is uh you know uh, showing his um his uh, his immense power and and uh, you know uh, 
in 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 the form of these tribulations that are happening and um it just seems that you know people are you know kind of uh you know showing allegiance to the devil but it but god is also uh having uh you know doing all these um uh, you know uh, these different um uh, you know activities that are happening during tribulation so um that's more of a comment but i just want to uh, get some get some answer on the on the first two questions mm -hmm. so the first question the tribulation begins as soon as the rapture happens how do we know that because um Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7 and 8. It says, when he is taken out of the way, the lawless one will be revealed. Second Thessalonians 2, 7 and 8. So as soon as the church is taken out of the way, the Antichrist will be revealed. And that, that is Revelation 6, verse 1. He comes riding on a white horse. So the tribulation begins as soon as the church is raptured. Um, and the Antichrist immediately establishes he comes into prominence mainly because of him setting up this covenant of peace uh, in Daniel 9 and verse 27 it says he will confirm a covenant which is in modern language a peace treaty with many for one week one week is seven years as we explained from Daniel so he sets up a peace treaty, a peace accord, or a covenant for one week or for seven years. So the, 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 as soon as the rapture happens, the Antichrist comes into prominence because of his ability to set up a peace treaty. Uh, so the seven-year peace treaty is established right at the beginning, but it also marks the beginning of that seven-year tribulation. So all this happens at the very beginning. As soon as the rapture happens, peace fall in place. And that's the beginning of the seven-year tribulation. And yes, during the seven-year tribulation, you know, God is pouring out his judgments on the earth. And here the Antichrist, uh, the dragon, Satan, is also trying, you know, to do what he can to deceive, basically to deceive people, to keep people on his side. Right, so... Um in so, in some ways, some some of the some of the uh, things that are happening right now in uh, in Israel and you know the, the Palestines, um, and uh, just what happened as you, as you mentioned earlier, uh, you know where they are uh, now trying to you know they've got into the uh, in, into the Al Aqsa Mosque and uh, you know they're trying to um, yeah, uh, you know, recover some uh, some ground over there where some of the Palestine uh, Palestine people are. Are uh, creating havoc, havoc over there. So they've actually, you know, crossed that, and it's, it's happened before. But this is all, you know, this is sometimes like a, you know, a precursor to a war uh, that can happen. Um, so it could be possible that a war like that that could that could happen um, is also uh, an opportunity for, uh, you know, a peace treaty to happen after that. Uh, because obviously, you know, peace will happen only after a war. Mm. So it's just trying to, just trying to, uh, you know, uh, you know, understand uh, from a point of view of, you know, timeline. Uh, again, you know, I'm not saying that, you know, you know, where the rapture would happen in in, in that in that case. Mm. Uh, but you know, they, that that could be one opportunity, right? Um, mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So I think you know what the things we are observing currently are really setting the stage for this amazing peace treaty that the Antichrist will bring. But there have been because you know there have been several attempts in the past, starting from I think from the from the seventies, eighties. You know, let's set up a peace treaty. You know, Bill Clinton called. Uh, I think yeah, uh, you know, he called the Palestinian leader uh, the Jewish. The Israel leader, they had a peace accord. So, so many, so many peace accords have been signed, but nothing really has settled the issue. So, I think it's just building up to a place, a time and a place where somebody from that region itself, you know, all along it's been somebody from, you know, from from the north, from North America, from 
Europe, uh, basically from North America, trying to do something. But somebody from that region itself coming up and saying, hey, I can do this. And it's going to set the, it's setting up the stage where somebody from there is going to try to broker the seven year peace treaty. Yeah. Yeah. But just to add, I think the, I think the fundamental difference in this peace treaty is that uh, in this case, uh, the Temple Mount would actually be given to, give, would be given to Israel. Yes. Uh, and then, you know, they will get their, get, they will get their, uh, you know, their, the right to uh, start uh, operating the the Temple Mount mm. never happened before, and it's probably one of the most contentious, uh, uh, you know, uh, mm. areas that um, that um, <laughs> I, I mean, I somewhere somewhere Israel is going to gain, gain, gain mm. get some advantage over there mm -hmm. for the very first time. Mm. Mm. True. True. So. Let's step into chapter 14. Let's see, uh, we might be able to finish this before. Um, so chapter 14 is another one of those, um, what we could say, parenthetical chapters, meaning uh, the, you know, it's like, okay, we have finished seven seals, seven seal judgments, seven trumpet judgments, we're getting ready for the seven bowls, which are like, this is the final deal. This is the final, the third woe that's going to be poured out. But before that, chapters 14 and 15 are kind of sandwiched there. And they're telling us something that, that, that's going to happen before this third woe actually is poured out. Chapter 14 is very interesting. Chapter 14 is a chapter of announcements. That means John is seeing that in chapter 14, there are five angels that have been sent by God to announce messages to people. So that's one part of what we're going to see in chapter 14. It's very interesting to see the announcements these angels are making and also to think how is this going to happen practically. We'll get to it. And the other interesting thing in chapter 14 is the 144,000 Jewish servants. He saw them in chapter 7 in the, in the first half of the tribulation. They've been marked by God. They call the servants of God, which means they're going to serve God in some way. We've journeyed now into the second half of the tribulation. We've crossed the middle point. We're in the second half of the tribulation. We don't know where exactly, where exactly in the middle, or where exactly in the second half, but we are on the, in the second half. And by the time chapter 14 opens, these 144,000 Jews are in heaven. So big question is, how did they get to heaven? Did they all die and then go there? Were they raptured, taken to heaven? Or did they die, were they then resurrected and taken to heaven? You know, how did they get there? It's a question. So let's try to see what chapter 14 says. Let's read the first five verses, please. Revelation 14, 1 through 5, three verses each. Let's make a start. Go ahead. Then I looked, and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven, like the voice of many waters, and like the voice of loud thunder. And I heard the sound of harpists playing their harps. They sang as it were a new song before the throne, before the four living creatures and the elders. And no one could learn the song except the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth. Thank you. Verses 4 and 5, somebody, please. 
These are the, These ones, are the ones who who were one different. Go ahead, brother. These are the ones who were not defiled with women, for their virgins. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. These were redeemed from among men, being first fruits to God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no deceit, for they are without fault before the throne of God. Hmm. So. This passage is giving us some more insight about these 144,000 Jews. So it's telling us that at this point, when in John's vision, they are he's seeing them in the heavenly Jerusalem, Mount Zion, there in heaven, not on earth, in heaven. He's seeing them there in the presence of God, and um, they are worshiping God with a song that nobody else sings. So they're very special. They got their own song. Very special. They're worshiping God. But then notice certain things he tells us. Verse 3, he's telling us that they were redeemed from the earth. Yeah, we know that they were on the earth, they were anointed by God on the earth as servants. Now he's saying they were redeemed from the earth. Then he says, was for they did not defile themselves with women. So Seems like these, or based on that, we say these 144,000 were men, Jewish men, and they were unmarried, they didn't marry. And so either it can be used to talk about physically their life, or if this first part of verse 4 was to indicate spiritually, that means they were spiritually completely committed to Jesus Christ. They follow the Lamb, that means they were totally committed to Jesus Christ. And once again, at end of verse 4 says, they were redeemed from among men, being first fruits to God and to the Lamb. So, we say, okay, 144,000 Jews, they are now in heaven. These are wonderful men because uh, they it says here they, uh, they there was no deceit in their mouth I mean they were very virtuous men men of integrity they are uh, without fault over the throne uh, they you know if you verse four they they were they didn't get married they were faithful to Jesus throughout their life. But what does it mean when it says they were redeemed from among men and were first fruits to God and to the Lamb? So this is where we have to try to interpret what he's saying. They were redeemed from among men. This phrase was used uh, earlier in chapter seven, and it when when John sees you know people standing before the throne of God in chapter seven. In white robes, he says, "Who are these people?" And he says, "And they have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed, and they're standing before the throne of God." So, it's possible that term they redeemed from among men uh, is, you know, that is telling us that God had taken them, you know, out of the earth. Uh, but that the word first fruits is also key. First fruits. Now, the word first fruits you trace it in the New Testament. It is used to talk about being raised from the dead. It's used often in that context. Either your first fruits in terms of being born again, James chapter 1, or first fruits being raised from the dead, 1 Corinthians 15. So, based on these two terms being used, redeemed from among men, from redeemed from the earth, first fruits to God, to the Lamb. It's most likely, again, we're only saying most likely because we, we, it's not stated plainly. We are trying to interpret that it's possible that these Jews, 144,000, they were killed, but God raised them up and took them to heaven, or maybe they were just raptured directly and taken up to heaven, something. We don't know for sure. But First fruit is significant because 
they seem to make up the first group of people taken out of the tribulation in a glorified body. Whether they were raptured into their glorified body or whether they were resurrected into their glorified body, we don't know exactly. But the word first fruits is significant, indicating that they received glorified bodies. Otherwise, that you know, that first fruits uh, would not have been used for them. So it seems to tell us that this was the first batch of people from among the Jews, the Jews, who received their glorified bodies, how, whether it's directly into rapture or death and then resurrection into the glorified, we don't know. But there is a these are the first batch of people who, from the tribulation who are likely to have received it. Now, when we come to Revelation 20, we will see that everybody who was martyred during the tribulation will receive glorified bodies. That is at the end of the tribulation. But for these 144, God is not waiting till that time. He's giving them the resurrected bodies ahead of time, first fruits, in that sense, coming out of the tribulation, treating these 144,000 Jews believers in a very special way. So what is unknown is, did they die and receive their resurrected bodies, or were they just raptured and receive the resurrected bodies, we don't know. But the first fruits, the term first fruits seem to indicate that they receive their glorified bodies ahead of schedule. Because at the end of the tribulation, everybody who was martyred in the tri tribulation receives their glorified bodies. And they are there up in heaven worshiping God. Is that okay? Yes, Pastor. So, in the rest of chapter 14, which we will pick up next week, I think next week uh, we should be able to finish. Uh, we'll, we again have three hours, and we should finish that. Um, uh, you know, we should be able to finish the book of Revelation next week, Thursday. Uh, so, next week we'll pick up here in chapter 14. We've got about eight chapters left. So, I think we should be able to finish it. Next week, we go for three hours straight. Um, and uh, yeah, we will do this next week. I see Asha's question. Just curious. It's good to be curious. Do you suppose that all that we are reading and learning is taking place slowly in the world we are living in? Yeah. Uh, I mean, a lot of the things that, especially when we are going through the book of Revelation, and you know we will see some amazing things coming up, chapter 16, 17, 18. We'll say, hey, these are things that can actually happen right now. Right now. It's amazing. It it was an impossibility in John's time. But today it can happen like that. So and we'd see, we've already seen some of these things, and we will continue to see as we go through 16, 17, 18, that some of the things that were written, that were written by John 2,000 years ago, so like, man, these things can actually happen today. And we are living in that kind of a time. So, uh, you know, now, of course, it's, it hasn't happened yet, but it could happen. Now God will take us out of the way and then all of these things will be fulfilled. So before we dismiss, any questions so far? All right. Uh, let's close in prayer. We'll dismiss and we'll connect again next Thursday. Uh, it should be our final day of uh, lectures on Revelation. We'll try and finish it up. Good. Could somebody pray and dismiss us, please? Dear God, thank you so much, Lord, for this time that we get to learn what it is to be knowing that um, that what you revealed to John, that 
Lord, that as we are living in these days and our God of the we uh, so to your present hunger for more of you and also Lord, to have access and command us, God, to go into the world and preach the good news, to bring our brothers and sisters to your kingdom, God. Thank you, Lord, for this time, Lord, that we may be um, be aware of what you're doing in our lives and experience your spirit to move inside our lives, God. Thank you, Lord, for Pastor Ashish, Lord, that you bless him and uh, continue to be using God as you have called him to do greater things. Lord, I pray for my classmates and that as they're about to leave, Lord, that they will ponder what you've been taught them, hide them in their heart and meditate it because you are a good father and you are such a wonderful, faithful, and loving person, Lord. Thank you for everything and you may pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day. See you again next week. God bless. Bye now.